Good evening, friends. How is everybody? I'm a minute early, and I just thought I would pop on a minute early. And here I am, um, wiping lipstick off my wine glass. It's been a hell of a day. I don't know why today was rough, but here we are. Um, how are you tonight? How's everything going? Tonight, we're going to do... Ra <gasps> I'm hugging you. So, somebody asked me through a um, message, Elizabeth, why are you reading your book loud? Like, what's the purpose of that? And I said, why the hell not? Why not put on makeup at 7 o'clock at night when I'm not going anywhere and and show off my nice gray outgrowth and put a flower in my hair. Why not? Because that's where we're at. I love you, Autumn. Okay, so today is day two of our book. Isn't that fun? Yes, it, it makes me very excited. And because I'm not going anywhere for a long time, I figure every night I can dress up a little bit and it'll make me feel better. Okay. Today is day two of our reading of On Tenter Hooks. And yes, this is my book, and that's fine. I feel comfortable with that. Um, so where did we leave off yesterday? If you're just tuning in and you didn't listen to yesterday, then go back and listen to yesterday. Um, you can hop in now, but we're on Chapter 5 already, so it's up to you. Wine drinking will ensue tonight because I've had a rough day. Okay, so we left off. Lucy had found um, a diary hidden in her apartment, and she had just lost her job. She's like a mess. She's all sweaty and gross. She just spent time with her friend who helped her out, and now she's in her apartment, and she's kind of reminiscing about the things that she's found out about the woman in her diary and just kind of how that connects to her. So how, how does that connect to her? So we're going to start off in chapter five. Autumn, I'm so glad you're here. I wish you were here, here, but this will suffice. Okay, chapter five. Lucy's parents were boating enthusiasts, and Mr. and Mrs. Mathers set off one beautiful spring morning on an overnight excursion from Chicago to Burns Harbor in Indiana. 11-year-old Lucy was sent off to school angry that day that she could not be included, as she loved impromptu adventures and hated being left behind. Stubborn kisses were exchanged as Mrs. Mathers handed Lucy her overnight bag. Please don't be angry with us. Daddy and I will be back tomorrow night, and you're staying at Claire's on a school night, said Mrs. Mathers. But I want to be with you guys, Lucy whined. Mr. Mathers stooped down and took Lucy in his arms and watched his daughter lace up her pink Chuck Taylors. He gently pinched her cheek and kissed her head. Look, baby girl, how about we do something great this weekend? A trip up to Sutton's Bay? Maybe we could get you out of school early and have a picnic. Lucy loved picnics and loved the drive up to Sutton's Bay in Michigan. A winding road up the coast of Lake Michigan, the dark bluish waters and sand dunes made you forget you were in the Midwest. Her father always put the top down on his 65 Camaro, and her long hair wildly lifted and twisted in the air, making a tiny, dirty blonde tornado. Okay, Daddy, that sounds all right, Lucy replied half-heartedly. He smiled and kissed her again. Speak of the devil, here comes Claire, said Mrs. Mathers. Good morning. Mrs. Mathers always called Claire sweet, and Claire loved her for it. A few extra kisses and hugs, and the girls set off to school. Making their way through the long grass that connected the Mathers' house to the Culpepper's, Lucy and Claire walked in silence. They reached the flagstone path Claire's father laid down 12 years prior when he heard his, his wife and their new neighbors, the Mathers, were pregnant. Lucy lugged her leather overnight bag down the path, completely annoyed and unaware of the fact that her father's Italian-made duffel bag was being mauled by the rock path below her. Lucy, let me hold that bag, Claire said in a motherly voice. This is insane. How could they give an 11-year-old a leather bag? Lucy rolled her eyes. Leather is very sturdy and wears well. Not when you're dragging it on the rocks, Claire said under her breath. 
Lucy meandered on and off the path, causing Claire to stagger off her side. Lucy was always moving, always mixing things up. Her 11 years of life had been a series of -of spur-of-the-moment adventures that never really allowed her to just be a kid. At times, she wondered why her parents had chosen this kind of life, but all too soon, unpredictability would become her coveted survival skill. School came and went, and Claire and Lucy found themselves walking back to the Culpepper house with a leather duffel bag. As the girls climbed up the white wood porch steps, Mrs. Culpepper greeted them with empty ice cream cones. Good afternoon, ladies. Anyone want some ice cream? Mrs. Culpepper knew that Lucy would be feeling down and was always attentive to her other daughter. Lucy and Claire smiled at each other as they dropped their bags on the porch and headed to the kitchen. Hi, Granny, Lucy said as she kissed Claire's grandmother, Cecilia, on the cheek. My little Lucy, Granny grabbed Lucy and hugged her tight. Granny went back to sitting at the kitchen table, paging through a magazine, her magnifying glass perched on a retractable arm. She smiled to herself and licked her vanilla ice cream cone, her bright pink nail polish. My nose is itching. Pause. It's like crazy. Her, she smiled to herself and licked her vanilla ice cream cone, her bright pink nail polish, bare toed tapping to the Andrew sisters playing on an old record player. Claire's little sister, Ivy, sat next to Granny coloring, and her teenage sister, Lee, hid in her usual spot in the corner of the living room reading. Lucy and Claire scooped their ice cream into large red bowls and headed to the kitchen island to apply their toppings. I love, love, love ice cream, said Lucy, adding a second scoop of sprinkles. Me too, said Claire, deliberately dripping vanilla ice cream down her chin. Lucy laughed as the pair made their way to the table. She felt so at home. As much as she loved getting away and seeing new places with her parents, she knew there was something so special about this family. She could stop and take a breath whenever she was in this house. There was a predictability that was comforting. Lucy closed her eyes and breathed. The sweet smell of her vanilla ice cream filled her nostrils, and she felt calm and at ease. Eat that ice cream before it melts, honey, said Mrs. Culpepper. Lucy opened her eyes and grabbed a spoon. As she dug into her sprinkled bowl, she glanced out the porch door and saw Mr. Culpepper climbing the stairs. He wasn't smiling, which caught Lucy off guard. He was always smiling. Mr. Culpepper came through the door and silently stared at his wife. Jim, what's wrong? Mrs. Culpepper asked, crossing the room to her husband. Kneeling down in front of Lucy, he grabbed her by the hand. Lucy, I'm afraid there's been an accident. Chapter 6 And a Sip of Wine It's up in school, Debbie, the first... Take two. It's up in school, Debbie, the front desk girl, said as Claire swept up strands of Lucy's hair. Hustling over to the phone, Claire's mind went in a thousand different directions. The what's and why's of the unknown brought a lump in her throat and a chill down her spine. Hello, this is Evans. Mom, is everything okay? Mrs. Culpepper, asked the school secretary. Ms. Culpepper, Claire corrected. What is the point of completing an application with emergency info if no one even looks at it? Thank you for reminding me that I am single, thought Claire. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, Ms. Culpepper. Evan has been involved in a slight scuffle at school. Can you come pick him up? Is he hurt? Claire asked, confused by the call. Evan never gets in fights. He's very passive, very much like his grandfather. He has a small cut under his eye and he'll probably have a black eye tomorrow. He's in good spirits, though. I'll be there in 15 minutes. As Claire hung up the phone, her mind raced. A fight? It's just not like him. Claire walked quickly to the back room and grabbed her purse. As she rounded the corner, she smacked into Jack and fell the kind of fall where you really hit your tailbone and know it's going to hurt so much later. Her purple and brown floral skirt shot up, exposing her boy shorts. Claire noticed Jack immediately look away as he helped her up off the floor. Are you okay? The girls told me about Lucy. Where is she? Claire interrupted him and smoothed down her skirt. Looking for her purse, she said, Lucy's the least of my worries. The school called. Evan was in a fight. What? Is he okay? That doesn't sound like him. Do you want me to come with you? Jack loved Evan like his own son. 
They got along really well, and as far as he was concerned, Jack was practically the kid's father. Overwhelmed by all the questions, Claire felt her chest tighten. No, no, I can go myself. I really don't like explaining who you are anyway. Claire often made light of the relationship, hurting Jack's feelings in the process. Sorry, I didn't mean that in a negative way. I just meant Claire started to defend her rude comment. Don't worry about it. Just go get him. Jack handed Claire her keys. She grabbed his hand and smiled. Hey, can you do the dishes? Of course, he said. That's all I'm good for around here. Jack winked at her. Thanks, Claire shouted as she walked out the door into the heat. Chapter 7. Eben sat in the principal's office with an ice pack on his left eye. At ten, he was pretty smart on his feet and was able to punch Will Jacobs in the face before the teacher broke up their fight. It was Will who threw the first punch right after Eben called him a douchebag. Eben winced in pain as he shifted the ice pack a little lower on his face. He thought about his mother. She is going to be so angry, he thought. A typically well-behaved kid, Eben never got in trouble physically with anyone. It was his bold and tenacious attitude that put him in the principal's office a few times that year. The school nurse came into the room and took the ice pack from Eben's eye. How are you doing, buddy? She asked. I'm okay. You didn't call my mom, did you? Eben looked nervously at the nurse. Of course we did. We have to call parents when any blood is shed or if someone is being disruptive to the well-being of the school, said the nurse. Which means... If you punch someone in the face, the school has to call your parents. Eben heard her first and then saw his mother coming into the office. The principal was following her. Her eyes brimmed with tears, and Claire hugged her son. Are you okay? What the hell happened? Oh, I'm sorry. What the heck happened? Claire often forgot that Eben was a kid and that she needed to set an example. Mom, I'm fine. I just got in a fight. Eben looked away from his mother's intense stare. He didn't want to tell her what started the fight and what had been going on. It seems Evan and Will Jacob, Jacobs exchange words and a fight ensued. Neither one of the boys will say what the argument is about. Will's parents are out of town this week and I'm sure will want to talk about this when they get back, explained the principal. The cut on Evan's eye might need a stitch or two, so I would suggest getting him to urgent care to check it out. Claire looked at Evan, wondering what had sparked this fight. Evan never hit. He was assertive, yes, but not aggressive. Evan looked at his mother, and then he looked away. If he looked at her too much, he might start crying. He didn't want to look like a baby in front of the nurse and the principal. So now what, asked Claire, waiting for the punishment. See, he's never done anything like this before, so I don't... The principal cut her off. It's a two-day suspension for fighting. Evan will be on a three-month probation. If his behavior does not improve... Well, let's just say his behavior will improve. I think this was an isolated incident. As bland and cold as the principal was, Claire liked him. He didn't sugarcoat anything and got straight to the point. I would encourage you guys to talk about this and discuss a better choice for further encounters with someone you do not get along with. He looked at Evan. Understand? Evan shook his head in embarrassment and agreed. Claire and Eben silently left the room and headed out to the school parking lot. Claire shook her head. She needed time to think about how to handle this, but when it came to parenting tough situations, she always felt like she was in the hot seat and never prepared with a wise enough answer. She decided to be honest. Eben, I don't know what to say. What happened? Who is this kid? Eben laughed as they approached Claire's green Volkswagen. Do you think this is funny? said Claire, annoyed by his flippant attitude. No, I don't. I'm just trying to figure out what to say. Claire got into the driver's seat and did not put the key in the ignition. Evan got in the passenger side and threw his backpack on the floor. He was glad the nurse gave him an ice pack because it helped him hide his eyes from his mother. Well, Claire said in a firm tone, can you tell me what happened? Who is Will Jacobs? Evan sighed and contemplated telling him the truth. Hello, please don't ignore me, Evan. I just want help. Evan knew he should just get it over with. Will has been teasing me for days about not having a dad. Do I have to go to urgent care? He asked, changing the subject. Claire got nervous and quiet. Realizing she was the adult and needed to talk about this with her son, she replied, What did you say to him when he said he didn't have a dad? Well, for a few days, I just ignored him. 
He's been pushing me around the halls, trying to pick fights with me at recess. Yeah, and then what? Asked Clara, dreading the next response. Then this morning, he called me a bastard. And mom, at first, I didn't know what that meant, so I looked it up in the dictionary like we do at home when we don't know what a word means. And it said it was a derogatory word for someone whose mother and father are not married or something. Derogatory, said Clara, correcting him. So then you punched him? After I looked the word up, I went to the teacher to ask her what derogatory meant, and she told me it is using a word in a way that is unkind, sort of like calling someone a bad name. So I went up to him while he was sitting at his desk and called him the worst thing I could think of. Evan looked away from his mother. Here we go, thought Claire. What did you call him, Evan? Evan looked at his mother and said, Mom, I called him a douchebag. Claire laughed out loud. I'm sorry, I should not laugh, and neither should you, she said as Evan grinned. He loved making his mom laugh. Okay, Claire began to figure out the rest of her story. So you called him a name, he hit you, and you hit him back. Yeah, I'm really sorry, Mom, Evan said, playing with his melting ice bag. It's okay, let's just get home and talk about this later. Okay, Evan said, resting his head on the back of the seat. He put his ice back on his eye. And besides, I do sort of have a dad. It's Jack, right? Claire closed her eyes and instantly felt like crying. I'm screwing this kid up by having Jack around, she thought. Is Jack his dad? Not wanting to answer the question, Claire put her fingers through Evan's curly hair and replied, We'll talk about that later, too. Ouch, Mom, he yelled, flinching away from her hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me take a look at your eye. Claire took the ice pack away and gently placed her hand on Evan's face. Close your eye for a second if you can. I want to take off the band-aid. Claire hated blood, but when it came to her kid, she could handle anything. It's one of those butterfly ones to keep the skin together. The nurse said, stop talking for a second, Claire interrupted. Um, yeah, you need to go to urgent care. In peeling back the band-aid, Claire could see Evan's eye through the opening of the skin. His eyelid skin was split between his eyebrow bone and his eyelid. Okay, that's going to need stitches, bud. Let's go. I'll get you a treat after. Yes, ice cream and a donut, please. You got it, buddy, said Claire, putting the key into the ignition. How come Jack didn't come with you, said Evan? Is he at work? Maybe he could meet us at urgent care. You've got your mama. I'll hold your hand, Claire smiled and kissed Evan on the cheek. Ouch, Evan shouted. Claire pulled the car out of the school lot and drove towards the closest urgent care. She couldn't decide if she was bothered by the fact that Evan wanted Jack or felt comforted by it. Her relationship with Jack had become stale. There was love there once, and now they were stuck. Someone had to make a move. Evan, even more guilt welled up inside Claire when she allowed her feelings for Jack to surface. Claire told herself to shut up. That was so many years ago, and she needed to move on, but to her, everything right now was perfect, so why mess it up? Claire shook the uncertainty of life with Jack out of her mind and turned to her son. I love you, buddy, she said, pinching his cheek. Thanks, Mom. I love you, too, Evan said with a smile. All right, I think we're going to do... We're going to do one more chapter. Now I'm going to itch my nose again. Why is my nose so itchy today? Drink. Chapter 8. <laughs> Chapter 8. Hey, Michelle. Hello, Mother. Lucy felt like C.W. was her sister after reading the diary all morning. Brewing a fresh pot of tea, she clutched the book, not wanting to let her new friend go. Nestling up on the window seat under the studio windows, Lucy opened the diary and walked back into C.W.'s world. Thursday, August 9th, 1930. I've been hesitating to put down on paper what drove me to Stephen's hotel. The day before I slept with Stephen was like any other day in my life. I walked with my four-year-old sister, Laura, and five-year-old brother, Thomas, to our victory garden to collect the summer harvest. I'm always so excited to share this food with Mother, especially especially since she's been so sick during her pregnancy. Thirteen children. Can you believe it? I don't mind tending to the kids during this time. Mother needs a rest. The smell of lavender in one of the baskets filled the air around us as we walked back home. I reminded Laura and Thomas many times to keep up, their little legs practically running to stay close to me. 
the vegetables were so fresh and we ate most of the cherry tomatoes on the way. We made a secret vow not to tell anyone. Reaching the neighbor's lilac bushes, I heard the screen door of our house slam and heavy footsteps stomp down the wooden planks we called stairs. It was him. I could see his black hair beyond the bushes and feel his anger before he reached us. I whispered to Thomas and Laura to be quiet and hugged their bodies behind mine. The smell of whiskey greeted me before he did. Too late to run, I stood still. He slammed into me, sending the basket of vegetables into the air and the rest smash, smashing into his chest. I braced myself for a hit, but he did nothing except call me a corva, whore in Polish, and walk away. The three of us took off for the house wanting mother. I opened the door and there she was on the floor. She was lying so still I thought she was dead. Blood was running down the side of her temple. She was breathing, but just barely. I told Laura and Thomas that mother would be fine to go play in the yard. They listened as they always did. And as I watched them walk to the back of the house, Thomas put his arm around Laura. He's such a good boy. I yelled for Je Jeffrey and Teddy, but no one was home to help. She needed the doctor, but how could I leave her? The thought of father turning around and coming right back and me not being there to protect mother when it happened terrified me. As I looked around, I noticed that mother's legs were bleeding and blood was starting to soak into the hem of her dress. That bastard beat her and left. I ran across the street knowing the officer who watches over our neighborhood would be near. A friend of mother and father since childhood, I knew he would come to help. Officer Bill Huntley said nothing when I told him mother was in trouble. He simply took off running toward our house. His jaw was free, furiously tense, and I could tell he was talking to himself the whole way. When he saw her, he whispered her name and held her. The sound of her name confused me. Officer Huntley said it with such softness and care, the way father should have said it. We took her to the hospital, and I waited for hours on a bench outside the room, the whole time praying she wasn't dead. I wish father dead hundreds of times for hurting her, but this time was different. I overheard two of the nurses say she'd been hit in the stomach with something. The baby was dead. They talked a bit about father and wondered where he was and then shush shushed each other at the sight of me on the bench. When I finally was able to enter the room, I could barely see the real her. The bruises and cuts were horrifying. And when mother finally came to, she told me it had been an accident. I couldn't believe she was defending him. I screamed so loudly that the nurses came in and had to drag me out of the room. God have mercy, her face was the worst part. Her lip was split, her eyes swollen, and under the hospital gown, bruises and fingerprints told me that she had, he had choked her. Father liked to use his belt, and I have the scars of the buckle on my legs to prove it. As she talked, she looked out the window, and I clutched the edge of the bed at the sight of a deep-stitched cut under the portion of her head. Her teeth were soaking in a cup next to the bed. Mother had lost her teeth when she was 20, and Father bought her false ones as a wedding gift. The nurses sat me back on the bench in the hall and told me I couldn't go back in to see my mother until I could control myself. I don't understand why no one will help Mother. Help us. Yes, I know husbands beat their wives, but how can that be legal? I fumed at father and cursed him for hours in my head until late that night when Officer Huntley stopped by to check on mother. I begged him to help her, and what drove me to leave her that day was what he told me next. You see, there was nothing they could do to father because mother was impressing charges. That sick bastard, only good for getting mother pregnant, doesn't help feed us or love us. He just beats us and throws food at us like we're dogs. I couldn't take it anymore, so I ran. I went to Stevens, knowing he wouldn't ask me any questions about why I had blood on my shoes. He would get me new clothes and take me out to dinner and got me drunk. That's what I needed to forget. Signed, C.W. Lucy buried her head into a nearby pillow and cried. She wept at the thought of C.W.'s mother being beaten, and as the bright sun shone through the skylights, Lucy wished she had been with her parents the day they died. Her contacts, now completely dried out and suctioned to her eyeballs, stung as she blinked over and over to moisten them. 
Lucy groped her way down the hall to the bathroom and found a saline bottle in the sink and doused her face. The salty saline solution began to burn and she dropped the bottle into the white pedestal sink. Lucy poked at her eye, trying to get the contact out as quickly as possible. She finally breathed as she removed her wrinkled contact and threw them into the sink. Lucy rubbed her eyes and let out a sigh of relief. Nearly blind without her contact, she opened the medicine cabinet and found her red rim glasses. Lucy's stomach grumbled, and she realized all she'd eaten in the last 24 hours had been coffee and iced tea at Claire's. Lucy felt like she'd been beaten up and thrown down a flight of stairs. Stepping into the small kitchen, she finally thought about the fact she was out of work again. Years from the next installment of inheritance her parents left her, Lucy knew the day would come when she'd blown all her money. Recalling multiple frivolous trips with Claire and daily shopping sprees, Lucy admitted to herself that the situation was nothing but pathetic. She made just enough tea for two cups, grabbed a bowl of watermelon from the fridge, and sat at the cafe table in the corner of her kitchen. Her apartment was extremely unique, which is why she'd bought it. A converted art studio, it was small, but it had a lot of light. Most of the walls were windows, even in the bathroom. The bathroom was her favorite. A pedestal sting, sink and toilet on the right and a clawfoot tub on the left of the room. Blue mosaic tired, tiles covered the walls, almost making them appear like waves. On the walls next to the shower were small ice cube-like blocks, which let plenty of light through. Above the blocks were a pop-out rectangular window that exposed the Chicago skyline. Lucy finished off the watermelon and brought the dirty dishes to the sink. She stared out the window over the sink at the hummingbird feeder. Its once bright red water had turned into a foggy puddle of death for a wasp. Lucy inhaled the aroma of tea leaves brewing and let the warm sun shine on her closed eyes. A faint humming filled the air as she stood silently leaning against the porcelain. Opening her eyes, Lucy watched as two hummingbirds appeared on the feeder. Goosebumps and deja vu sensations rushed over her. She had lived in this moment before, after her parents had died. Her mother loved hummingbirds, and for years, countless hours and seasons creating a haven for them. The sight of these two made Lucy's tired mind wander from C.W.'s diary to her childhood home. She was 16, living with her uncle. In a lush but grossly overgrown garden, Lucy sat on her mother's hammock, reading a book about ancient Rome. These feeders are crazy, her uncle Robert said with disgust as he looked around at the ten hummingbird feeders that surrounded his niece. At 35, Robert was a smart guy who was itching to get out of Chicago. He was appointed to being Lucy's guardian at 28 and was counting down the days until he could finally be on his own. You have to create a safe place with lots to eat for hummingbirds, Lucy replied, not wanting to talk. I haven't seen any hummingbirds, he said. Well, I just put them up this year. The hummingbirds had no food for so many years and they don't know it's here. They'll find their way back. We just have to be patient. Okay, whatever, I'm headed out. Remember, I'm out of town this weekend, and you are, Robert asked, annoyed and ready to be finished with this pseudo-dad crap. I'm going over to stay with Claire. Yes, I know. I'll leave right after I finish this book. I'll see you on Monday. Robert turned and left, revving his pickup truck and rumbling away. Quiet at last, Lucy thought. A small breeze lifted up a page on the side of her book. Her hair flipped over her sunglasses, and she slowly pulled the strand back behind her head, not wanting to miss a word about the story of Caligula. She tucked the stray hair into her headband. She felt a buzzing behind her and swatted at whatever was trying to pester her. Another buzz, or was that a humming? Lucy looked up from her book. The wind rushed up to her, and with it came one, two, then four more hummingbirds. Lucy gasped at everything around her and everything went still. Trying not to breathe, she quickly glanced around the hovering birds. Hearing a humming behind her, Lucy slowly turned to see a green and black bird staring at her. Its head cocked to the side. The sound of its humming replaced the air around her. Lucy felt a peace she had never felt before. Her heart began to ache as a warm breeze gently lifted her out of the hammock. A tear rolled down her face as Lucy closed her eyes. She could only think of one person. Mama. All right, I think we'll stop there. 
so what's gonna happen? Claire is like deep into this diary where this young woman is being beaten up. But back then, that's what happened. You know, and nobody cared. Nobody talked about it. Um, thank you girls so much for being here today. Thank you to Autumn and to Michelle and to my wonderful mama. Um, I hope you girls have a wonderful night and then I will be back tomorrow and we will continue on. All right. Have a lovely, I know it's such a bummer that, okay, we won't talk about it. All right, girls. Love you. Have a wonderful night and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.